Welcome to the SPS Digital Learning Hour, brought to you by the Digital Learning and Assessment Department. We're coming to you today from a conference room in Central Office, bringing you the latest news in Springfield Public Schools in regards to technology, along with inspiring interviews from teachers who are using technology in the classroom. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Mike Thomas, the Bearded Tech Ed Guy. You can find me out on all the socials at Bearded Tech Ed, my website, beardedtechedguy.com, or the MySPS internal homepages under We Learn. So I do apologize for my cold. I came on all of a sudden the last 24 hours. I sound a little bit congested. That's because I am. A few quick updates, and then we're going to get into the meat of this week and the next few weeks. If you missed out last week and this past week, we've posted out a couple of new blog posts all about project, problem, and challenge-based learning. This past week was part two, which is problem-based learning. And so you get to really see the difference between what project-based learning is, problem-based learning, and then next week we'll talk about challenge-based learning. One thing I will let you know, though, is that there's a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of differences. And this is just the beginning of research, and I hope that if something interests you, that you will go out and find more about it. We make sure that there's plenty of resources in the blog for that. You can find it under We Learn Blog on the My SPS page or at beardedtechedguide.com. A few other updates, and by a few, I mean a lot. This week, there was a conference happening over in England and a conference in Florida on education technology, and Microsoft went overboard with all the announcements that they were making. I'm just going to give you some of the highlights. If you're looking for more information, check out the show notes. I'm going to link to Mike Tolfson, who is a OneNote guru and among other things. He keeps us all up to date with everything that's happening within Microsoft Tools for Education. He posted together a great wakelet, which keeps track of every announcement that has happened along with more details than I'm going to give you just now. But a few of the big highlights that I was super excited to see was that live captioning is coming to OneNote. Now, live captioning, if you don't know what that is, you need to check out PowerPoint. PowerPoint has this ability to have live captioning, where as you're speaking, the words pop up on the bottom of the screen. And so it really helps you become a good presenter because you have to make sure that the words that come up on the bottom of the screen are the words that are coming out of your mouth. And so that tool is now going to be in OneNote. And what's really awesome about that tool and about the live captioning is that it has a translator built in. So if you speak English, it translates to Spanish. And because it's AI, the more you use it, the better it gets and the more likely it will be correct. As we all know with translators, some are word for word, some are very disconcerting with what you're trying to say versus what you actually say. The AI that Microsoft has put into these live captioning tools has improved dramatically and that's going to be available. Edge is moving to Chromium, which I know in here in Springfield, we're all very excited about that because what that means for us is that Unified Classroom will work in Edge with this new update. The old Edge did not have all the tools that it needed. This Edge Chromium does. What's really great, especially for Unified Classroom, is the moments you're logged onto the computer, you log into Edge, you're logged into your OneDrive, you're logged into all your Office 365 tools, you log in, you go to classroom.powerschool.com, it logs you in. You are logged in everywhere. That's you use your Microsoft credentials. And if not, you hit the Microsoft login with Microsoft button and it automatically does it. So that is something we're super excited about. Make sure that you get your teams on your PLCs on teams. Office Lens has a translator built into it now. So when it takes a picture of a document, it can translate it into other languages. I mean, how awesome is that? Also coming to OneNote to be able to save and send out so people can save a copy to their OneNote of any PDs that you're doing, any templates that you're creating so that they don't mess with yours and they have their own. Also, very important in education that the bulk OneNote delete is coming, which means that say you created a page and it's in 40 notebooks, but then you realize you don't need that page or it's distracting or it's not right or whatever the reason, you wanna be able to take that away this would be the tool that will allow you to do that. 
This was just a small fraction, guys, of all the announcements that Microsoft made. Microsoft Word has improvements, Excel, PowerPoints, everything that we use, Flipgrid, Teams, so many updates. Check out the show notes for the link to the Wakelet from Mike Tolson. So normally in the show, this is the part where I'll say, coming up next is our interview of the week. We're actually taking a different approach for the next few weeks. One of our blog series that we're going to be doing is all about game-based learning, gamification, and we're going to do a book study on a book that is all about those things. Before we get started with that, though, we thought it would be very important for us to look back and see where we've come from with our knowledge. And so to do that, we are going to be updating some blog posts from years past and then reposting them with some new updated information. We're also going to look at conversations that we've had on this podcast over the 80 plus episodes that we've done on gamification and game-based learning. So each week for the next few weeks, you'll hear a conversation that was had either with myself, Suzanne, and Brendan when it was the three of us doing the podcast, or you'll hear my musings on it before we get into this book study. And then hopefully by the end of our time, I'll be able to get the authors of the book. I'm not letting you know the book today. You have to listen next week to find out what book we are going to be doing this book study on so that you can join us through the blog. So the whole blog, podcast, they're all going to be intertwined together. And we're super excited about this idea and this project. And we really hope that you get a lot out of it because as you'll find out with this first discussion on game-based learning, You're going to hear how excited I am about these concepts. So take a listen. Welcome back. My hot take for this week comes from Ed Surge News. It's one of the companies that I follow on Twitter, which gives me a lot of great ed tech updates. And the article was entitled How Game-Based Learning Encourages Growth Mindset. And it's kind of, for me, Suzanne, it's one of those jump up and down and shake my (laughs) arms all around. Yes, yes, yes. Because we know you love game-based learning. I do love game-based learning. And I love growth mindset. And I do love growth mindset too. I especially learned when I learned about it through Class Dojo last year. So in this article, it talks about how game-based learning is the approach that we need, especially when it comes to teaching math. The article mainly focused on math and not the other subjects, which I thought was okay to help get their point across on how game-based learning is very similar to a growth mindset learning. So when you play a game, a lot of times you have to do these three things. You have to persevere, you have to problem solve, and there has to be some level of creativity with it. And so when you're playing the game, you're going about, these are skills that we consider soft skills, but they're a part of how we do everything. And in the game world, a player, someone who's new to it, expects to struggle at first and not get it. And then they get to go back and they get to do it again. And they get to do it again. And they get to do it again and again until they get it, which is the growth mindset almost in its entirety, which is kind of a fun way to look at it. Right. It's definitely a fun way to look at it. And I I love how students do jump at the chance to play a game and they forget about the fact that they're learning something along the way. Uh, So I'm, I'm very excited about this this twist on mm-hmm. learning of course you know Mike I love math and I mm-hmm. and I love teaching math so there's a part of me as I read this that is thinking wait wait we're still trying to get so many teachers to understand how to teach math effectively regardless mm-hmm. of technology right is this going to take away from their understanding is it going to um, almost give them an out if they don't like math themselves are they going to just be inclined to have students do this game-based learning and still not understand it. But I'm not too nervous because I think overall this will end up helping them in understanding that students learn differently and it may take them time within this game to master it, but they're giving them that time. Right. And I think it's less about an actual game as it is more about a game philosophy because the game gaming philosophy is very much a growth mindset philosophy because players start out expecting to struggle, make mistakes. They eagerly replay levels, pushing through barriers to make headway. There is no such thing as 
failing in a digital game, all you have to do is hit replay and try again and try again. This is a quote directly from the article. And one of the things that they're trying to make the point of is that students or gamers have that growth mindset. They don't sit down and immediately start playing Minecraft and are an expert. They don't start to sit down and start playing Oregon Trail and are an expert. I've played it enough to know exactly when you should start, what role you should have, so that you make it to the end. And so the idea in games and failing is you get to restart and retry, or depending on the game you're playing, respawn. Most of the students, one of the things that they point out, I actually did the math on this too because I was curious. So there's about 42 two weeks of school in a school year. The article talks about, uh, from one study, boys, 99% of boys, so that's just about everybody, and 94% of girls, which is almost everybody, um, averages between the ages of 12 and 17 playing at least 7 to 10 hours a week. So if you think about that average per week includes school weeks, and so my thought was, all right, so what does that mean for school? And this might seem like a scary number to think about, but it's 300 to 420 hours in a school year that they spend playing games. So if we start adding up the hours after school, before bed, they're playing a lot of games. So they actually have the growth mindset within them. It's just not applied academically. Right. I think that's the the biggest challenge is helping everyone understand that just because it's labeled game-based learning doesn't mean that they're just playing a game, that Mm -hmm. they're just having fun. There's actually so much learning going on while they're doing this. And it's intriguing to me how students love to do the game-based learning and, and particularly in math and how much they improve in their math skills using this versus when I think of some of the classrooms that I've had. And a lot of times within one room, you have uh, three or four kids who excel at math. And so whatever the lesson is, Mm -hmm. there's that group that knows the answer right away. And then another group that may take a little more support, but they get it. And then you have another group that needs additional support. And when you're in a group setting, even when you when you break out and you have a small group in front of you, with that whole class setting, I think there is still a certain amount of peer pressure amongst the, the entire class, whereas if everybody's doing this game-based learning, I think that takes away some of that pressure. So someone who may need additional support Mm-hmm. is not in the spotlight, is not the one sitting there saying, I don't get it, I don't get it, and shying away. Right. They have all the time they need within this game. No one's watching over their shoulder. No one's ridiculing them if they don't get it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah, so they have three main points to this article, which I think help kind of break down this um, growth mindset even more. And the first one is games welcome players of all ability levels in the same environment. Our classrooms can too. So there's always this push and pull with classrooms about setting up classes so that either you've got like your struggling class, your advanced class, and your middle of the road class. Some schools do this, some don't. Um, The article talks about that as achievement gaps widen and class sizes grow, have grown over the last two decades, that has been one strategy is by kind of separating kids out into their groups, which they're starting to see has not been good because for one, there's no good role model students to help bring up the other students. Um, Two, it creates like a fixed mindset. If you're in the low math class, you know you're in the low math class. I have students that I've talked to that are middle school and high school students. They know if they're in the low math class or not. They know if they're taking Algebra 1 a second year in a row with a whole bunch of freshmen. They know that. And so it creates in their mind that it's something they can't do. And with game-based learning, everybody comes in at the same level. What they pointed out in here was there was a recent study, it doesn't say where the study was from, that found that Algebra 1 is the most repeated class. Um, And grades for Algebra 1 testing 
go down in the second year for those students who are repeating. And that some schools have started interventions for math as young as kindergarten. That I, I completely believe. That's what, that's where I taught was the, <laughs> the primary grades. So you can see early on their understanding or lack thereof of numbers. But what I found um, even more interesting, Mike, in the next paragraph where it says students with adv- advanced skills can be negatively affected by the ability grouping as well. I'll repeat that. Students with advanced skills can be negatively affected by the ability grouping as well, which I think comes as a surprise to some people because your first reaction is, oh, if it's if it's a group of students with advanced skills, then they can be challenged and you can give them mm-hmm. all kinds of opportunities to continue to exceed. But what I think a lot of people fail to see is that often, often praised for being smart, high achievers can become risk avoidant. And I've heard this in, in a variety of articles that I've read and and conversations that I've had that the students who excel are so accustomed to getting that perfect grade Mm -hmm. and being the smartest one, then some anxiety starts to come into play because they think they, they need to be perfect all the time and they don't want to take a risk and fail. They feel they have to do it right every time. I think that's part of the like larger issue with the growth mindset and the fixed mindset is when we have these groups, when that advanced group gets together and everybody's being praised for doing well, no one's going to step out and make mistakes. And mistakes in math is where we tend to learn the most. I know for me, I learned how to do long division because of countless mistakes. And even today, I'll make some of those mistakes still, but then I know to go back and double check. I know how to figure out what I did wrong because I am not adverse to taking the risk of making a mistake. And I think in all three levels, like if you if schools are grouping students that way, all three levels get into this fixed mindset where they're either not going to take risks, they already know they can't do it, so they're not going to try as hard, or they know that they're going to be stuck forever in math purgatory because they know their abilities and that's it. They There's no growth mindset in it. And with game-based learning, you can turn around and everybody in, can be in the same classroom. Just like the article you talked about with the personalized learning last week, you could have 70 math students all together and you can have 70 different math levels working all together. The teacher can still teach the main concept for the day and then everybody goes off and works on what they need to, including working and building that concept up more. So that's another thing. I don't I don't want to necessarily jump ahead of myself in the points that I had after reading this article, but I'm going to anyways. When it comes to teaching math, it takes practice, lots and lots of practice. And so whether the student is ready for it or not, they need to have those basic skills before they can jump into the harder things. Like um, I've been reading a lot about the difference between like spiraling math education and mastery based. Mastery based is all stuck on here's your skills. You're going to master them. Once you master them, you move on to the next set of skills and each skill builds off of each other. A lot of spiral is you learn something new, but you then you practice a lot of the old. And then you learn something new and you practice a lot of the old. And you learn something new and you practice a lot of the old with all those new things being added to the old the following day. And so I don't know necessarily where I fall on that scale. I like the idea of mastery based because I remember student teaching, um, the doing a five, six grade. So half the class was fifth grade, half the class was six, and there would be lots of switching, all sorts of things. The fifth graders were using one math curriculum, which was all about the mastery based. And then they moved up when they started the sixth grade curriculum. It was a lot more investigative. Um, it was, they call it connected math, which is investigations for the older grades, which is a lot more of you're creating your own understanding. But they were able to do that because they had those mastery of the, the skills prior. So I know that kind of jumps into a tangent off of this. It does. And now I have two different thoughts going on and I hope I don't forget my my first <laughs> thought. But my opinion on the spiraling versus the mastery Uh, I do lean more towards the mastery. I understand the benefits of the spiral, um, the spiral way of teaching. Um, But from experience, I I do know that younger students with that type of uh, curriculum, I found that if they didn't get a particular concept the first time, then the second time it came around, they already had it ingrained in their head that, oh, I didn't get this. I didn't get it last time Mm -hmm. and they have given up already. And when it comes the second time or the third time or the fourth time, they've already given up. 
in contrast to that, when you think of game-based learning, mm-hmm. when did you ever see a child give up on whatever game they were playing? I don't think ever, right? right? Even if they fail multiple, multiple times at whatever they're trying to achieve, whatever level it is, whatever mm-hmm. <laughs> that game is doing, I've never seen a child give up. And even at their greatest point of frustration, and maybe I'm just thinking of my sons at this point, <laughs> but at their greatest point of frustration, someone whether it's a sibling or a friend, jumps in and helps them. And they say, oh, you just need to do this, this, and this. And then they work together to get to the next Mm -hmm. level, which I would like to believe would be the same even if it was more educational. Right, and I think that's what adaptive – like when we think about like adaptive education and personalized education, that's essentially it is that you keep working at it and if you need help, help comes – to help you, right? whether it's a teacher or a video in the game or just some more practice or another way of explaining it. We were at a conference this week and one of the students said sometimes they learn best from a video, even though the teacher had been teaching it, they could, teacher could have done a great job, but they didn't get the concept till they saw it from another point of view. And so that's part of like adaptive learning and personalized learning and Game-based learning can be very personalized. So again, if we think back to last week and that whole 70 students in a classroom and you're personalizing the learning for them, something like an adaptive um, game-based learning could be really useful in that. Because what it does is it does a lot of the heavy lifting. As a teacher, I, I shudder when I was reading last week, like doing 70 different lesson plans or like trying to differentiate for 70 kids. It was hard enough for 20. I can't imagine adding another 50 or 60. You don't need sleep though, right, Mike? (laughs) No, no sleep's needed. So with game-based learning, with it being adaptive, it does a lot of that heavy lifting for you because it is monitoring the students. You can monitor the students. You can see how they're doing. And it creates a lot of good, useful, applicable data, which is very important when you're thinking about teaching and planning and preparing and trying to make your students, not make your students, that would be a bad way to put it, to help your students achieve at their highest levels and beyond. And always instilling Mm -hmm. in their mind, you may not have it now, you might not have it yet, but you will get it eventually. Mm -hmm. So they talk about, um, which if you go and you look up our show notes, in this article, they actually give a bunch of examples of games, of game-based learning programs that you can use in your classroom at different levels. And so they talk about, in the article, one of those games called Prodigy. I'm probably mispronouncing that wrong. Prodigy. Prodigy, maybe Prodigy, I don't know. Um, Teachers are able to challenge and remediate students' learning as needed, all in the same class period. The GBL, game-based learning platform, continuously delivers differentiated content, scaffolds, and extensions to students based on their current levels of understanding, allowing teachers to focus precious class time on guided learning. And then, as you know, when kids are playing games, they're very eager when they're playing it, so they want to keep going and keep going. And going and going. going. Which is not a bad thing when they're learning, right? As long as they're learning, we're happy. Yeah. The second point they make after that long, long first point is gamers embrace challenges and use mistakes to learn. Again, when you make mistakes in math class, that's when you learn the most. Because it, you're not learning anything if you already know how to do it. Um, so it, a, it offers students chances to take risks without feeling that pressure of all the people around them kind of silently judging them. Which I think is it's very important because to get a student to take a risk nowadays is already hard because they're so focused on doing everything right the first time. Right, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm noticing this uh, quote from Alina Tugend, I'm probably mispronouncing that, <laughs> author of Better by Mistake, where she writes that we are raising a generation of children who are terrified of blundering or failing, of even sitting in the discomfort of not knowing something for a few minutes. Think of that. I mean, try to think back of how you felt when you were in first grade, second grade, third grade, or 10th grade, right? When maybe everyone around you knew the answer 
knew their geometry. <laughs> yes, and and you didn't. We don't want our students to be terrified. We don't want our students to be afraid of making a mistake. And I think the whole game-based learning concept um, just reiterates or supports the collaboration among students. They're helping each other to succeed in this game because to them it's just a game. It's not schoolwork. Right, and so then almost by osmosis, the skills that they're learning in the games can then turn around and be applied to the tests that they're taking. Exactly. One of the interesting parts of this section of the article is they talk about how, like, kind of the difference with math instruction. And in some ways, I I don't want to say good or bad math instruction because we all have our own opinions on that. Um, But they say math instructional practices that value speed and memorization do not honor the time and interaction with topics that students need in order to construct meaning. If students aren't able to construct meaning with their math, like how it works, then they're less likely to retain it. Right. You, I hope that we get a lot of comments on this. I can only imagine mm-hmm. that any math teacher out there is going to have an opinion on whether or not speed and memorization is the way to go. Mm-hmm. And I have, I won't go off on a tangent because this <laughs> would definitely get me talking for an hour, but I do see benefits uh, in certain situations of having that speed and memorization, but mm-hmm. you can't do that until you do have that complete comprehension of what you're doing to memorize your multiplication tables and still not understand what you're doing when you memorize those numbers Mm -hmm. is not going to help you when you have to do three-digit multiplication examples. Right. And so I just think like when I think of memorization, like you just did, you immediately jump to multiplication facts. We don't think about the fact that we, we memorize how to add or subtract, like the process to do that. When we think a lot of times about memorization, that's where it comes from. Or this was the one that got me when I was in high school was memorizing all the formulas for everything and then going to sit down and take the SAT and realizing like I knew what the formula was, but I didn't know how to apply it. Mm -hmm. And so, and I knew how to do my math fast because we were trained SAT, you get four hours for, and it's one of those things where it's like, You're sitting there and you're going as fast as you can to get as much done as you can. I think back to a couple of years ago when we did park, um, that first time when it was timed, you had 70 minutes or depending on whatever grade you are, 60 to 90 to 120, where you had to get your answer down in a timely manner. Not all of us think that way. Not all of us can have process speed to understand these problems. And so that's where I'm like, oh, I I see the point with the speed and memorization. But on the other hand, if you have that constructed meaning, the speed and memorization comes. Exactly. So it's almost like one needs to be taught before the other. Like you need to have the understanding and then you can do the memorizing and then you'll be better off. I agree. Completely agree on that one. And so... Um, again, with the whole embracing challenges and learning from mistakes, when you're playing a game, you get that chance to start over. I know we've said this a few times already, but there's that stigma with being like the first kid in the class with a hand up and then being wrong every time. Because I don't know about you, but in my time teaching, I've had those students who immediately raise their hand because they want to answer, but then they have no clue what they're talking about. And you're standing there being like, "Uh uh-huh, okay, we're going to try it this way now. (laughs) So I don't know about you, but I've had those experiences. And so, and for some students, after a few times of that, they would just shut down and not offer up any thoughts or answers anymore because they were afraid of making mistakes because they could see the looks on their classmates' faces when they made the mistakes. Right. And this is where I think um, the challenge is for the teachers to embrace whatever response the student has, put it back to the class and uh, say, okay, this is, this is one possible solution. What do we think? And mm-hmm. just as you would within a game, have everyone offer their suggestions or offer their, um, their proof or disproof of why that mm-hmm. answer would or wouldn't work. Um, but trying to, and this is going to play into my hot take later, but try and play into the curiosity factor of, okay, well, mm-hmm. tell us more. Why did you say that? And... 
right what else can we find out but i mean it's definitely not easy right because you've got a time factor just in how long you have to teach your students math Mm -hmm. that day um not an easy task no it is not and so that's why when we talk about things like this we're hoping to help you as a teacher now be able to apply technology in ways that will help your students grow The last point that they make um, is games offer immediate, useful, friendly feedback that is designed to motivate students to keep playing. When I read that, it kind of like put a little knife into me because if I had the opportunity like they do in game-based learning to get that immediate feedback and I was able to give that to 20 students at the same time, I could have been a much more effective teacher. I think we all would if we can be able to have that time. But as you were just mentioned, there's a time limit to how long you teach math, depending on your day. You Maybe you get 60 minutes, maybe you get 90 minutes. Maybe you only get 45, and then you have to come back to it later for another 30. Trying to teach the lesson, have your beginning of your class, your intro part, have your exit ticket, have all of that, and be able to give feedback to every one of those students at the moment they need it. It's like, oh. I could be such a better teacher if I could do that. Right. And And that's what game-based learning provides, is it provides that opportunity. Exactly. I mean, how many times, I I don't, again, we taught different grade levels, but when with the real young kids, I would always relate to my own daughter. And I would hate to think of a child in my classroom that was working really hard and um, improving on their skills and whatever, whatever the task may be, when you've got... 25 to 30 kids in front of you, you can't give that immediate feedback to every single one in the class. And I would always feel bad for the one that I didn't happen to get to that Mm -hmm. day. And so this would eliminate that. Right. And it would also eliminate the, when you do get the feedback to them, where does that feedback go? In the trash. Mm -hmm. Because they're already done with it. They've already learned their lesson. Whether good or bad, whether right or wrong, it's already ingrained into them and it helps develop that fixed mindset which is what we're trying to get away from because we want them to have the thinking that they can do anything that as long as they are working hard when they're doing those three things that are the pillars of the growth mindset persistence oh i have to turn my list over because i'm going to forget now persistence perseverance problem solving creativity i know i just said four things there but um if Students have those things. They can solve any problem, whether it's math or if you want to apply this to other subjects in science or English. There's a, I feel like I read somewhere that like, not War and Peace, but like The Grapes of Wrath is like written at like a third or fourth grade level, like word wise. But to understand it, you need to be much, much older. And then I think about like reading Harry Potter. Those books, they are difficult reads. For anyone who is not in middle school or up, if you're in the upper elementary school where you find a lot of the books, they're hard for reading and understanding because they're at such a higher level. And so this idea that um, totally lost my train of thought, it happens, but it's the whole we're going to I'm looking back down on my paper now. So being able to have that targeted feedback. So I don't know where I was going with it well, a moment before. Well, you were also talking about the perseverance, the problem solving. The creativity. The creativity, which would allow you to reach higher levels than you would initially think that you were able to. Right. Right, which is what I'm thinking with those mm-hmm. with those books. I know my daughter was very anxious to read the Harry Potter books at an age that she was, she was too young to really understand what mm-hmm. was going on. So she must have had that growth mindset. <laughs> yeah. So while this is all useful information, learning about the game-based learning, It's all about practically how do we apply it. And that's one of the things that we're going to continue to work on. It's one of the things that I'm probably going to blog about a lot next year because I think that it can be something very useful for a district our size and for the classrooms that we have, the sizes that they are. And what I loved about this article, Mike, that you didn't mention uh, at the end of the article, 
which you will be able to see uh, as a link on... Wherever you're (laughs) listening to this podcast. So um, every time Mike would talk about game-based learning, there was a a part of me that said, well, I need an example. I have to see it. I I don't Mm -hmm. get it. When I think of game-based learning, I have your Oregon Trail example Mm -hmm. that you always give me. But I need more examples. So there's a great list of examples at the end of this article. And it tells you exactly what they're learning and at what... Um, grade level it's appropriate for. For example, um, a game called Deepest Ocean will help students with comparison with inequalities, and that's for elementary to middle school. There's also Pyramid Panic Light, which will help students with lengths, perimeters, and areas and shapes, and that's again for elementary to middle. There's another one, Pinata Fever, which will help students with add and subtracting negative numbers. That is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's middle to high school. So there's a long list, but I was so grateful to see this list because it it just solidified in my mind um, what these games can look like. Yeah. And you also don't need to be a master coder or you you don't even need to change your entire math practice. You can also start small. Um, Traditionally, there's like the... um, the intro to classes and then the class tickets out like you can start to turn those things into games along the way game-based learning doesn't just have to be a computer game with the adaptive learning you can have your exit ticket your class openers and then once you're comfortable with that you can continue to add in segments into your class which eventually leads to using having like a flipped classroom or a blended lesson that gets all that differentiation out there and there's a a detailed description of this mike in the article because i was going Mm -hmm. to ask um i was going to ask you how much time a teacher could expect to spend during the day on game-based learning for a particular subject um for creating a lesson or a unit um not for creating or for students using but for the students using it um, again, that goes back to the teacher, like however much you're comfortable doing. And so if you're comfortable with just a little, then you do just a little. If you are comfortable with going full force into it, you can use something like Prodigy or if you have iReady or I, there's other games out there that my mind's blanking on for math right now. Or going out and trying to create your own if you're that tech savvy. So I think it all comes back to you as a teacher with what you're comfortable doing. And Mike is looking at me right now because I just had a great idea And he's thinking, what is Suzanne going to say? I am. (laughs) But wouldn't it be awesome if some of our high school students created a game for the elementary students? I'm sure they Mm -hmm. could do it. I'm sure they could too. I can see it being worked into the curriculum somehow so that they reach not only their goals, but also can help teach younger students too. Mm-hmm. So again, this article was from Ed Surge. Ed Surge is a great resource. I would check them out if I were you. The article was called How Game-Based Learning Encourages Growth Mindset. So to give you time and date on this conversation that you just heard, this was part of episode 10 published back in June of 2017. So right near the end of that school year, we had only done 10 episodes up to that point. And as you'll hear throughout these episodes that we post into the future, that my knowledge of game-based learning has grown a lot. I hope you guys got a lot out of that conversation as Like I said, the beginning of the introduction to game-based learning and gamification. Next week, we'll get into another episode that'll focus mainly on gamification. So I highly encourage you to just continue listening with us. And I thank you today for taking your time out and listening to the SBS Digital Learning Hour. And listening to me, Mike Thomas, the Bearded Tech Ed Guy, we are so very thankful to all of you who listen. We hope that this upcoming series and the melding of the blog and the podcast together is going to help you develop more strategies and tools and understandings of how to use game-based learning and gamification in the classroom. If you love this episode and you're not already a subscriber, what are you doing? You got to subscribe. It allows us to continue to reach new heights and spread out 
the message of all the amazing things that are happening in this district, and it helps us become more visible. So wherever you listen to us, whether that's iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, the MySPS page, wherever that is, we'd love to hear from you. So make sure you give us a rating, leave us a review. It is very much appreciated. And that's it for this week. I'm Mike Thomas, the Bearded Tech Ed Guy, and this is the SPS Digital Learning Hour.